All right, today I'm going to be talking about the algebra of TypeScript. A couple of caveats to this talk is I am still learning this content, so I expect some of this to be wrong. I'm also somewhat unfamiliar with TypeScript, so uh, perhaps some of the TypeScript I have written is wrong. Uh, feel free to interrupt and ask any questions. Show me a couple of times why I would like some audience participation. So uh, I'll get started. Um, so as we're all, sorry, let me find the right mouse. Oops. As we're all familiar, I think we're all familiar with algebra from school. Um, an algebra is <laughs> consists of symbols like zero, one, two, or letters representing other operations. Um, operations like plus, minus, multiplication, addition, division, and they all abide by laws like um, zero plus x equaling x. Um, specifically in TypeScript, the symbols for an algebra would be types like void or number or Boolean. The operations would be type constructors. So these aren't types themselves, but these are types that take types to produce types. And then laws is kind of open for us to discuss today. So a bit more abstractly, algebras, the symbols are things, the operations are ways to make new things, and the laws are the rules the things follow. So the first thing we're gonna do is start with zero. Uh, can anyone tell me like what a good type representation of zero in TypeScript might be? Any, any interest? Em empty object? Empty objects. In TypeScript, I believe that might be represented by never. So never is a type that cannot, you cannot actually create an instance of this type. And um, for clarity sake, I am type aliasing this to void, which is the most common term for, you know, for discussing this type. So zero, this is a type that does not have any values whatsoever. You can't actually create an instance of this type, but it represents the fact that nothing exists. So it's a void. So for one, anyone have any suggestion of what a type representation of one in TypeScript might be? Any. Okay. So any. any, any would be any type. So that means anything can have that type. So that would be a, um, wouldn't be the, the one single value that we're looking for. Um, and of course, this is all a bit of a hand wavy argument um, because everything can be undefined. That is a second value that everything has, but that we're just gonna kind of ignore that for the purposes of this talk. Uh, um, so void would actually be the, the representation of the single, singly inhabited value. Um, and that's often called unit. So representation of two, the canonical representation of two is bool with a constructor, an empty constructor for both false and true values. And now we'll continue on to, oh, so this is, so because void also represents one, we could have rewritten bool as void or void. Um, the TypeScript playground I was using rejected this because void could be undefined, um, but in theory, this should actually work. Three, so we can continue on this pattern of like, like two, and we can create multiple constructors that are empty to represent three or four or five or additional numbers. Um, this is somewhat tedious, somewhat beneficial in the sense that like maybe you wanna represent um, number seven for the weeks of the, of the days of the week, um, but it might be better if we actually had some more tooling to be able to create additional numbers. So the first bit of operations we're gonna discuss is addition. So what does it mean to add two types together? In TypeScript, this can be represented by the either type, which has two inhabitants. It has either a left of an E or a right of an A, and it's re often represented with a plus sign. So how many values of type either bool three are there? Well, we can have a left of five. five. Sorry. Five. <laughs> Sorry, I should have waited. Three plus Thank two you. is five. Three plus two is five. That's right. We're doing addition here. So we have left false and left true. Then we have right one, right two, and right three. Summed up, that is five. So addition abides by some laws. The first law is that zero, the never type, or, or called void, um, plus 
some value is equal to that value in the type system that would be void x is somewhat is isomorphic to x so these aren't equalities these aren't saying these are on the nose exactly the same thing but they're the isomorphism means that there's like an invertible function there's a way of writing a function that translates from one to the other and back and forth so another law that addition abides by is commutativity commutativity it's x plus y is equal to y plus x which is represented by either x y being isomorphic to either y x um, so that's addition the next operation i want to discuss is multiplication so what does it mean to multiply two types um, the canonical representation of this is often the tuple um, in the type system i'm doing it with a pair um, and i believe this array syntax is the tuple syntax in typescript so that is often represented with the uh, multiplication sign. And so how many types, how many values of type pair bool three? All right, I right. know this one. Woo. What is it? Six factorial according to Prakash. <laughs> Six, and that's right. So we have pair of false and one, a pair of false and two, pair of false and three, a pair of true and one, pair of true and two, and pair of true and three. And that's a total of six values. So we are multiplying those together. And the laws that multiplication will abide by are the void type multiplied by any value is void, which is pair void x isomorphic to void. Um, one, sorry, unit times any value is that value. So which is the pair of this should be unit, not void. And x is isomorphic to x. Multiplication is also commutative. So x times y is equal to y times x, or isomorphic to it. OK, so the next operation I want to discuss is exponentiation. Anybody have a sense of like what exponentiation might look like in a type system? Functions, 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 functions. Woo! So I am uh, using the reader interface for this function. Um, it is just a, a wrapper around a function type. Um, it's represented R to A. And when you're doing it in the exponential way, it's um, A to the R power. So you're kind of reversing the two. And this is basically representing all, it's like a total function. So all values from type R map to some value of type A. So how many values of type bool to the three are there? I'm not going to answer. Oh, it's eight. So it's two to the third power because it is adding. I think I have a, actually, I didn't actually add all these up because they were too much to fit on one screen. So each type two to the two to the two equals eight. So laws that exponentiation abides by are unit again i got these i got void in here too many times <laughs> unit to the a power equals unit so a to the unit equals is isomorphic to unit a to the unit power is isomorphic to a so it's unit to a is a this one is so the product of b and c to the a power is equal to b to the a times c to the a which in types this is basically a to the pair of b and c which is isomorphic to a pair of functions from a to b and a to c c to the b to the a power is equal to c to the b power to the a power which is on curry if you're familiar with it or curry or we forget it's curry um so you have a pair to a to b to c so another type that so we've talked about other operations and i mentioned that option either or other operations that we can do in algebras so i kind of wanted to give an example of what those other operations might look algebraically so option is often called optional or maybe in other type systems it helps represent the fact that something can be null so in the type system, this would be an option of A 
and it has two constructors, one that takes no parameters represented by none and another that represents the value. So none represents nil and sum of some value represents that value exists. And algebraically that would be written as one plus a. On to recursive types. Um, so we've covered numbers, addition, multiplication, exponentiation, which is function types, and then now recursive types. There are many different examples of this. I'm just going to give one. Um, the most canonical example will be lists. Um, this time I chose to rewrite this not in the TypeScript way, which would be an array, but I wanted to explicitly call it the list type. Um, so lists have two constructors, and it's another sum type. So nil, which represents the fact that there's not an empty array, and then a list, a cons of a list A. So cons X of list X. So it's a very recursive type. And this will be a little bit easier if we actually start looking at the algebra. So we can rewrite this type as the algebra of one plus X times, sorry, one representing nil plus the vertical bar x times l of the x, so the cons of list x. Um, in a point-free style, we can reduce this to l1 plus x to the l, which is composition. So the x and l side by side represent composition. Uh, Tim, people are confused about the word yeah. cons. Yeah. Cons. Um, this is another constructor in the system. So it allows you to create a, I mean, the, the word can be, the word is, absolutely meaningless, um, not meaningless, sorry, it has like historical meaning, but it's actually irrelevant to the, to the use case. So it could be anything here, but it, it's a, a, viol a value that takes the first value of the array, sorry, it extracts the first value out of the array and then you have the rest of the array. And that's what the list X represents. Did that explain the question? And if anybody else has a more succinct answer, I'm happy to let them speak. I think cons is a um, is a lisp thing. Uh, I think there's I think that that word came over from the lisp world. Probably pretty easy to look up the history by digging into lisp and stuff. Okay, which is a, not types but functional language. Um, so back onto the algebras. So we are in a point free style. We're representing a list as one plus x and a list. So the head and the tail of the list. So don't, pretty much the only thing we can do with this is substitute the list for L. So following that along, um, we have one plus X plus one plus XL. And we can con continue to substitute and we end with one plus X plus X squared plus the list. And this continues on and on, and we end up with a, a series, which is, um, I believe is referred to as a Taylor series. Um, but this, what this is saying is list can either have, can either be empty, or it can have one value, or it can have two values, three values, et cetera, which is the canonical way we ex express a list. So how much how am I doing on time? Pretty good. All right, I wanted to show some algebraic structures where we could use some of these algebras, um, like, to, to apply them. So the most, a, a very common base algebra structure is called a magma. A magma is a type with a closed binary operation that can be represented by this interface. So it's uh, often called concat. So it'd be a, a the pair, uh, sorry, uh, a cross a to a. So it's a pair of a and x and y to a. Uh, the next, algebraic structure I want to mention is a semigroup, which it's a magma where the operation is associative. So we're, at, we're layering on additional structure each time we're, we're adding a new algebra. Um, so this is represented by a semigroup of A, which just extends magma A, but it has like a particular law it has to abide by, which is associativity. So that law is associativity, which says that concatting X with the concat of f, y, and z is isomorphic to concatting, I'm sorry, it's equal to concatting the, concat the concatting of x and y and z. This is a one where like TypeScript makes the syntax a little hard to see. Um, below, I'll give examples of addition being associative 
multiplication being associative, and then the function type being associative. Additionally, a list is also associative. But I didn't feel like dealing with the syntax for that one. So the last algebraic structure I'll speak about today is called a monoid. A monoid is a semigroup with an identity element. So we're layering on a new structure to it. So this is how you, this interface is defined. I missed the beginning of this. So I should say interface monoid extends semigroup um, and it adds an empty element, which is the um, kind of like a, a no-op in this algebra. So the algebra for a monoid is a pair with a value with a function that represents empty. So we saw earlier that unit to A is equivalent to A. And monoids, of course, abide by laws. Um, the additional law on top of associativity is identity. So concatting X with, an imp with the empty from the monoid is equivalent to concatting empty with X, which equals X. So in addition, that's no value plus x equaling x in multiplication that's one sorry that's zero the actual number zero plus x is x one times y one times x is x and then functions from x to x are x so there's a couple of implementations of a monoid in typescript um, first being called sum where zero is the empty value and addition is the concatenation. And another example would be product, where one is that empty value and multiplication is the, comp is the com composition of those numbers. So that's all the structures I'm gonna talk about today, but there is an entire world of algebras that we could be using. Um, and this is just a, this is not even a full list of them, but these are some of the other potential algebras and each, each one layering on different structure um, vertical to, I think it's top to bottom, there's like an additional structure happening um, with each. So the ultimate like galaxy brain implementation of this is something that's being called algebra driven design, where you can actually evolve your algebras and be able to design a system where you're just writing the algebras themselves and you can use like um, property-based testing to do the checking of the laws and actually help generate algebras for a system. So this is a way to like defining the structure of an API, for example, entirely in an algebra that could then be um, tested without ever actually writing any, any implementation code. And lastly, the, the thing that I used to get most of the types that I didn't write myself was a TypeScript library called FP to TS, which has the majority of these things that I've written in it. And that wraps up my talk on algebras of TypeScript. John Rogers. So I was about to ask what Aaron, I think, tried to answer, which is well, on some level, this is super interesting, but like on my day to day, why do I even care? This is crazy deep math. And I feel like I don't have any idea how I would apply this. Aaron sort of spoke to that a little bit. I wonder if this is, you're suggesting that TypeScript is not already doing this to t tell us that we're doing things right. Is that true? Or you would use this to build your type system and know that it is somehow smarter than the what I'm building by just saying, I need a new type. I'm just going to write this thing's a number and this thing's a string. And then we move on. Is that, yeah. does that make sense uh, as a question? <laughs> It doesn't make sense as a question. I think one thing I, I wanted to include in here that I didn't is like some more examples of how you could use monoids. So once you can define your, your the, once you understand that you have a monoid, there's a world of resource that opens up to you and how to um, manipulate that monoid to achieve an effect. Um, a great example from a recent podcast I listened to was from Twitter where they had their analytics. And they had both the, the old data analytics that they needed to compose with their real time data. And they were having trouble like writing these pipelines. And then the creator realized that what he had was just a monoid. And at that point, he could he, he had this full like 50 years of research into how to use monoids that he could then apply to manipulate that data. So what I'm suggesting is while this is advanced math, and you don't necessarily need it to do your day to day, when you start recognizing these structures in what you're doing, a, a 
world of opportunity opens up to you. So it's like basically like teaching you to start recognizing the mathematical structure underlying a lot of what um, we do day to day. And as I've been trying to apply this more and more, I've found that I can now transfer these concepts from one language to the other. So when I'm working in this world, I can actually, it doesn't really matter what language I'm in, as long as I have the ability to define these types. So you can start like breaking down problems into algebras and it doesn't really matter like the tooling that you're using per se to do it. So it's not necessarily relevant day to day, but it could be, I guess. It's all about, all about a perspective change. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? I think that- You have about one more minute. And then one minute. Michael. Hey, yeah, Sam, I, I don't have a question, but I uh, just to add more, more conversation around the how this stuff is used. I think an interesting thing that's hard to explain until after you've experienced it is that what you're talking about is like the low level, some of the low level details of this, but the thinking applies as you go higher up like your levels of abstraction and you can get it. I found that, do I know you're talking about this from like the Haskell world and stuff. I found that programming like in Haskell or programming with this stuff in mind is actually very different. The experience of it is very different. And so you do things like when you can represent things well enough in the type system, you're able to kind of state with a type the thing that you're trying to do. And then you can kind of work to that point and you're using a lot of this thinking. You're not maybe necessarily thinking about like- an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, one example that I, I feel like I always miss when I can't use TypeScript is like an entity type, like an entity has an identifier or maybe like created timestamp and updated timestamp and then maybe you have a user and a user doesn't have to be an entity and you can like sum those types together. Sometimes you want to create like a RESTful API that will create a user, but you're, you're passing in a contract that says it doesn't have ID or created at or updated at, but you could create two separate types that you can then union or sum uh, together and represent two different things. That yeah, make, yeah, that makes sense. I think that's a good concrete example. I think a, an example of the, of the way the experience is different is that you, I, like I found myself doing a thing where like, I would try my best to define the type that represented the end state that I wanted for my program. And then I would on the, you know, I would do that on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, I would state kind of all my starting types. Here's the data I have, here's the things I know about. And then I'd be trying to figure out how, what transformations do I need to go from the left hand to the right hand side? And so that thinking kind of like goes up, you know, and I think for a lot of us, we, we learned it at that level. And I still don't understand it at the level, the low level you understand it, Tim, but, um, but that's sort of a way some of these ideas that manifest that may not be obvious, but once you're doing it, it becomes very obvious that there's a different, you know, there's a different set of thinking and tools you're using. So in so much as that's helpful, I thought I'd throw it out. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I, there's a lot of really awesome conversation that I feel like people would love to continue, but we are um, want to make sure that we have enough time for the next talk. Um, so thanks, Tim. That was awesome.